Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Have you ever wondered what happens when a person is in a coma? Our guest today was in a coma. She got sick from the worldwide, let's say, disease that came out in 2019, 2020. And she was in a coma. She was put on a machine. And while she was in a coma, she had to fight demons. She was taken to another realm. After that, she was taken to heaven. You're going to want to stick around to hear this. Anne Harris, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So Anne, first, I know that uh, you're in ministry right now, but when yeah. you were growing up, uh, did you have a household of faith at all? When I was young, I was in church. I was an usher. When I was in the second grade, I was an usher. But when I got older, um, you know, we get older, we think we know it all. And I went back into the world and then God called me back and I answered the call to come back home. Now, so were your parents in ministry or were your parents Christians at all? No, you know about the Lord? my parents, my parents was Christians. My, um, mm. uh, my grandmother used to come and pick me up and take me to church. My mom was a Christian at one time and she backslid, but she came back. Um, they took us to church. My siblings, I have, uh, two, uh, two sisters and two two brothers and they took us to church and um, made kind of not made but we participated in you know church activities we sung in the choir we ushered and uh, so we was raised up pretty much in the church yes so you knew everything to do <laughs> so mm -hmm. so I mean I know your story is amazing and phenomenal but before that did you know that there was a supernatural realm before any of this when I was younger, I used to experience certain things uh, that was supernatural. And a lot of people didn't believe me when I would tell them or they would say I was kind of talking out my head or I didn't really know. Because when I was raised up, I was raised up in a traditional church that uh, <clears throat> pretty much they didn't really too much even they believed in prophets, you know, so it's pretty like the pastors and the evangelists and like that or the teachers. So when you did tell people things concerning things you've seen or even demons, they kind of looked at you like, you know, well, go put a, the Bible under your pillow and you'll be OK. So it was kind of like that. Wow. So you say that you saw things when you were younger. You mind sharing yeah. um, some things that um, you may have seen? I would see spirits. I would say things in the walls, like manifest, like spirits can walk through walls because they're spirit beings. And I would see them walk in the wall and stuff. And then when I would tell somebody else to look, they didn't see what I seen. So were they good spirits or bad spirits? <clears throat> I had a lot of encounter with uh, demonic spirits. Wow. I kind of had more um, spirit of fear, the spirit of torment. And I would see them or feel them. And when you would see and feel them, um, would you, I mean, did you even know to use the name of Jesus to get rid of them? I would say Jesus. And I used to be fearful as a little girl and I would throw the cover on my head. And, you know, all I could think about was the Bible was under my pillow and that my faith was the Bible was under my pillow. And, and through this faith in this Bible, God's going to shield me. And that's kind of what my faith was at a little girl. So you knew something was there. And then had you known that decades later, something I guess, supernatural would happen to you again. So take us mm -hmm. back to 2020. You got the worldwide sickness. Can't say it on the show, but um, <laughs> tell us what happened in 2020. In 2020, um, I had a vision and uh, God set me um, next to the seashore. And a lot of my vision, he will set me up on a mountain or he would set me by the sea and kind of mind me how he put John, you know, by the sea. And I was sat there and I was looking out in the ocean and I began to see the water move. Trouble like somebody was living under the water and then they appeared, people coming from under the water and a little fear came upon me. And I began to back back because I felt the evil from them. The evil was so powerful that when they walked towards me, I would back up and started saying, what is this? There's nobody can live and walk on water. What is I'm looking at? And as I began to uh, focus on it, I noticed they kept looking to their right 
and then they will look back at me. But every time they will look to their right, they will move with fear as they even move towards me. And then I said to myself, let me look what they looking at, because I noticed that there was fear for every step they took towards me. And as I looked to my left, which was their right, it was a tall angel, so tall that he reached beyond the clouds standing on my left side. And as I turned back around to see them again, they was already on me. And in, t in my natural mind, they actually touched my body. Uh, but the angel of the Lord stuck his arm out. And when he stuck his arm out, he stuck it like he crossed all over the ocean and the hand went between and slid between me and them. And as he did it, he spoke, that's further enough. And they had to stop and they backed back. And so he let me know that I had the victory. So I had told my kids, and but I said, I'm feeling trouble. I don't know why I'm troubled, but I got the victory. I kept saying, I know I got the victory because I seen the hands of the angel of the Lord block it and told it that was the father. It can go and it backed up from me and it went back from where it came from. And so uh, about a week later, you know, I got sick and uh, I thought I had you know, I thought I had the flu and I got really, really sick and um, I pressed on through it. And um, my husband asked me a question. He said, are you doing OK? I said, yeah. He said, you sure you don't need to go to the hospital? And I said, no, I'd be OK. So I got up and I went to the bathroom. And when I got to the bathroom, all of a sudden, when I stood up, I realized I had no strength. I began to shake. I began to, you know, my legs was weak and I fell over the bathroom counter and I said, bring me a chair hurry up and get me a chair. And he said, are you sure you okay? And I said, if I don't feel better, I'm going to go, you know, to the hospital. And I said, well, I'm going to go take my bath. And as I was doing that, I just like, it was about a second. So I was getting worse. And I fell back down into the chair. I said, I think you better call the ambulance. And he called the ambulance and there came. They thought I was having a heart attack because my heart was beating really, really, really fast. It's like it's about to come out of my chest um, by me being dizzy. And then I started having chest pains. And so when they checked me, the C was I having a heart attack. They thought I was based on when they took the MRI on me, <clears throat> EKG, excuse me, on me. And when they did EKG, they said, let's get her out of here now. And during that time, they asked me, you know, did I think I had the thing? And I said, you know, I don't think so because I haven't been nowhere. Uh, that's, I haven't been anywhere. I've been to church and and I began to tell them we stayed outside and we we were, you know, the mask outside. We did everything we were supposed to do and hand and wash our hands. So I didn't think it was that. I thought I had maybe the flu or something like that. And they kind of looked at one another and said, well, we need to get you to the hospital. So when they got me there, they wouldn't let my uh, husband come in. And so uh, when they got me there, they started testing me for all different things. And when they came back with the test, they said, well, you got the thing, you know. And, uh, and I couldn't believe it. And I was trying to think, how did I get it? And then they said it was going to keep me in the hospital for evaluation. That was it. And but I was feeling really, really bad. And they said, well, we're going to give you start an IV and give you something because, you know, to get some fluid in you and give you something to kind of because I had a fever. My fever started rising. A couple of days passed by. They told me I'll probably be home in a couple of days, maybe three days or five days. It passed. Then the second week came. They said, well, you uh, we don't know yet. <clears throat> by that time, they was coming in there putting a mask over my face. So I wore uh, something like a um, push to put a certain tube in me and whatever it was, my body had a religious action to it. It started burning my nose like fire. And then my nose kept on bleeding. It started bleeding and I would cry out. I was literally in tears saying, y'all don't understand. I can't, it's, it's burning, it's like acid in my nose. And it was so bad blood began to bubble like out of my nose and I reached up and I pulled it out of my nose because I felt like you know y'all saying this is going to help save me but at the same time I'm on fire it like literally burnt the inside of my uh took the meat off of me uh <clears throat> out of my nose and uh then they had to have another doctor come in like we don't put this on what can we do and they tried me on something else and when they did that they put the mask over my face which that wound up taking all the meat off of my face my nose all the meat came off peeled off my face and the next thing I knew I couldn't breathe I was hyperventilating I'm because I'm trying to breathe they said come on slow down I'm like you're telling me to slow down and I can't because I can't breathe 
And uh, when they did some tests, they came back in there, pretty much told me if they don't do this, that they didn't think I would make it ever home again. And um, I had to make some quick decisions. I had to make some phone calls and I asked them, can I call? And I was trying to call many people as possible. And I was trying to call them and, you know, keep my composure, not bust down and cry because the love that I have for my children, I, all of a sudden they were trying to mess with my mind, like, you know, and I had it but, you know, wrestle on this side. No, I'm going to survive. I'm going to make it through this. And that's how I came up, with, you know, the book name and everything. And I said, I'm going to I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And uh, you over here and people on the outside, the people that's dying. Um, and you hear some people, the nurses talking that people are talking about this for people over up there, overweight, if they're a certain age. But it was 30 years old people in there. There was 20 year old people dying everywhere. There was death around me. And so uh and I looked at them getting in corners, discussing my case, looking at me, shaking their head like, you know, she's going to be one of those statistics that not make it. And I had to let them know that what it was going to do to me, and it's not promise. They couldn't give me really no guarantee that I'll ever wake up again. At that time, they were just really discovering the, the effects it really did to me. And it was severe damage done. And so they put me in a coma. They put me in that coma. And so I had to call my family and tell them, uh, you know, I love them. I told all of them that I love them. I want to make sure that, that they last words of me that I love them. And so they put me in the coma. And when they did that, it went on. And um, I op God opened up my ear, my left ear to hear in a coma. And so that's why I said people can hear. Uh, I experienced hearing one doctor, I say, speaking death over me because he was literally kept saying, oh, she's not going to make it. And I can hear the very negativity in his voice more so he didn't care. I was just another body, another person, you know, and you can just felt that in his voice and I can hear that. So within, I couldn't talk. Nobody knew I can listen. The only person who I can hear or listen was God, because he's the one that opened my ear for me, hit them to say that. And uh, so I'm like, I'm not going to die. And I just, when I'm just like, I'm going to live. I, I, I'm not going out like this, you know? So as months passed by, um, they said I had uh, four blood clots in my lungs. I had uh, two large and two mediums. I had double pneumonia in both lungs. Um, I had R's. My body began to swell, retain water, liquid. I began to drown my lungs. My lungs was began to uh, deteriorate. Uh, then my heart uh, began to fail. Uh, my heart was, uh, they said, they were expecting me at that moment to have a massive heart attack, this blow, because it was just too, it was going too fast and too high. Uh, my lumbers was off. <clears throat> they continued to get, they gave me, uh, matter of fact, in the hospital, I caught the thing twice in the hospital. So I caught it twice. So back to back, my 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 body went through hits back to back, you know, uh, really going through this. Um, during that time I was there, uh, they was giving me so much medicine that the drugstore literally shut down and refused to give the hospital any more medicine. And they told uh, one doctor told uh, one of my family members that we gave her enough by herself to give the whole ward. And then they called my husband and asked my husband, was I on drugs? Uh, my husband was offended and like, on drugs? She's not on drugs. And they said, um, because nobody can take this level of medicine. He said, we have given her enough medicine to put an elephant on his back or put six horses down. That's how they described me to him. And they said, because my body, even through that, through that, I felt like the enemy was still trying to take me out because that level of fitting on in my body. And then they were saying that um, they thought I was on drugs because nobody can take that. My body was resisting it. And I know that was the power of God because it seemed like every area it was death knocking at my door. And, and the excuse was we have to do whatever it takes for her to survive. They was gonna airlift me to another uh, town, another city uh, without permission. 
and they, they had got the helicopter. They had called the room, the hospital, and got me a room. And just so happened, my husband did not do electronic signature because nobody can come to the hospital because the hospital was still shut down. So during this time, imagine I had no visitors or anything. And so the hospital was sh shut down. So when they told my husband, he told them, no, you're not gonna move her. Why would you move her without my permission? The doctor got so upset with him that he threw the phone and another doctor had to pick up the phone and you can hear him in the background. My husband said that he was saying that you want her to live and you said do it all costs. And my husband said, but you didn't even tell me and she's too weak to move and you're gonna airlift her. And the only thing blocked that, they had no electronic signature and they had called to get the signature. That's how he found out. If they could have got away with that, there's no telling what my life would have been now because that was going to put me on a certain, I would have been living on a machine. So the machine would totally took my body over. And so I felt that was an experiment. I come through that. God, I had to put me in a separate room where you, um, because of me catching the thing like I did constantly, they had to put me in a private room on a different ward. It's a floor where they put the um, diseased people that they can't spread nowhere. So they put me there for I can um, have my own air because you know the hospital is only recirculated. So they put me in a room that I was only getting fresh air. And during that time, my skin turned black. I turned very dark. Um, I lost all of my hair. I was totally bald. I had uh, tubes in um, both arms, not just IVs, I had tubes. I had a peg in my stomach, feeding me through my stomach. Um, so they, uh, I was on life support. Um, from life support, they had to send me to another hospital because now my body have totally depended on life support. So without life support, I wouldn't live. So um, my husband and stuff looked up this doctor and uh, they said he was very good. Um, that he was one of the best and he wouldn't had a, a meeting with that doctor and asked him, could he help me? And the doctor told him, yes. And he said, what is the chance that you can help get my wife off in life support and she can get a trait? So I went from life support to a trait. And then I had the trait in. He finally got me from that. During this time, I would like to share, you know, with anybody, you know, when they got somebody on life support, I wouldn't just pull the plug because man said so. Um, they did call my husband on November the 18th, which was my son's birthday, to pull the hospital plug. Uh, and my husband told him, no, you're not going to pull the plug. So they was going to pull my plug um, and said, then got upset with that because they said I was already a vegetable. And if I survived that, I was going to be a vegetable. And so they was trying to coach my family in pulling the plug because I don't think your mom will like this kind of life and y'all wouldn't, she wouldn't be the mom that you would know. Um, and I'm like to, to myself, well, really, how would they know? You don't know my character and you don't know me to say that. So did you go on my Facebook page? Did you look me up to see what kind of person I was? So, you know, um, they said that, um, because my left side of my brain was the only part really functioning and it wasn't doing a good job. And the right side was pretty much and uh, gone. And so that's why they diagnosed me being a vegetable. I would be totally dependable. So my, you know, I have to depend on man to take care of me. And they just didn't think that uh, they weren't ready to handle that. And so, but my husband kept saying, no, not the, we, not the God that we believe and the God that we serve. We believe, uh, we're gonna believe the report of the Lord. And so, because we are faith people, me and my husband both are ministry together. You know, I've been pastoring almost going on 20 years and all my children's in the house of God. So I, it's important to have a praying family. So I had a praying family and all of them believed in what I told them to. And so, and they stuck on what I said and they knew I said, and they said that she had the victory. And one of my kids said, are we gonna believe the prophet or we ain't gonna believe the prophet? And they said, we gonna believe. And so my family had cameras put in my room to watch me. And I, and I do believe 
from my experience, I can share with people, if you can have cameras put in your room for your parents or loved ones, do, do it because uh, I had a witch. Uh, I had a witch uh, in, in my room and, uh, and how we knew it was a witch that every time she would come, the monitors would go off. My body will react. I will go into like I'm having a seizure and they will have to run in and watch me. Uh, then my husband began to notice it and my kids began to notice it because like I said, they, we had cameras and they almost took like a night watch. There was somebody always watching me. Um, my husband's noticed that only when this particular nurse came in, I would react. And how would I would react in a coma when a woman come in there and my whole body goes off, the machines even goes off. And so they didn't believe it at first. So when they said they took a diary and began to write the hours, the shift she was on, they began to uh, knew when she was on and when she was off. And it never only happened when she came into my room. Then they went back and looked over the records and seen what he said was true about the machines going off, how I would react. Then they dismissed her. And it was a witch that was in my room. Uh, they was like demons beside of my bed. Uh, one thing about a hospital, and, and, and but in this particular time too, when the thing was out, there was a lot of deaf spirits walking around. And they was uh, coming around my bed and uh, there was, you know, um, and then when I was in a coma, one of my spiritual very uh, things that I can remember so well was my house was shaking. And, uh, and I hear Satan talking to me. I hear Satan standing on my right side and I hear the imps on the outside of my house. So it's like God put me in a house. And in this house, there was a bunch of people, but I was like protecting the people praying for them, but they was going through what I was going through, but I was praying for them. And I hear Satan tell them, and God opened my ears up, I'm in a coma. And he said, dig up her foundation. And I said, God, do you hear them? Do you hear them saying they're going to dig up my foundation? I'm like, God, my foundation. And, I, and so he allowed me, God allowed me to feel them digging at my foundation. And I said, Lord, I can feel them. I can hear them. And at that moment, God stopped talking. He wasn't talking. I'm like, and so I'm like, God, don't you hear? And everything, I was being rocked and the floor was shaking and it was trembling and I can hear the earth beneath me. During this time, I had no idea that they had diagnosed me with Parkinson's. They said, even she has Parkinson's now because of the shaking. The shaking didn't come from Parkinson's. I was having a spiritual shaking. It. So even in the spiritual realm, the earth was shaking. And, and, and it, but what it was, he was trying to dig up my spiritual foundation. He was trying to tear up my faith. And during that time, I kept saying, but in that vision, I kept saying, God got us. God got us. We're going to have to trust God. We're going to have to trust God. And, and, and I kept telling people it was going to be okay, but yet I'm trying to fight against what was going on with me because it's like all the pictures on the wall was coming, falling off. It was shaking. Then he gave me the understanding. He said, those that build a house upon the sand. He said, and when the storm come, if you don't, he said, it, it, you will fall. But because you, your house was built upon the rock, so when the wind come, it beat it against the, uh, the house and it didn't fall. He said, you were that house that I had placed upon a rock and you have faced a storm and it came against your body, which is the temple of God. And he said, and it shook you, but you stood. He said, but if you had been built on the sand, great would have been your fall. So I knew if I was not anchored in God, what he gave me there, this thing would have killed me. But because I was anchored in Jesus Christ, and when he came against me, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So he never said it wasn't come against you. He never said it wouldn't come now to your dwelling place, but it won't take you out. So he gave me the understanding of why, what the um, foundation represent. And Satan was telling the imps to do it. And then I hear Satan come back and say, didn't I tell you when I come back? And he threatened them and they was fearful of him. 
and I'm and I'm knowing all of this that Satan imps look up to Satan and they fear him. And when he gives them a demand, they have to go out the same way God, the same way, man, we have rank. We have office, even the police officers, the military, this is rank skilled. Heaven is rank skilled. So hell is rank skilled. And so he has sent them out to destroy me and they couldn't. And so, and I will go into one dimension to another. I think we talked about money. The money part was, here I go again in another place, in another area. And I told God, I said, Lord, everywhere I go, it seemed like I cannot escape. I want from one place or torment to another. I said, everywhere I go. And it's also spiritually and it's naturally because either, even, Every chain that my body did and every vision he gave me, it was a doctor report tagged to it, okay? Because they tell my family she's doing better, she out of danger. Next day they get a report, she's back in the pit again. We don't know what happened. So and that's how it was in my vision. One minute I felt like I was free from the enemy. I found peace and here they come again. And I hear the Lord said, he said, there are agents everywhere. He said, Satan has agents everywhere. They're on every corner, they're on every block. He said, man just can't see them. He said, like, I have angels everywhere, but everybody can't see them. He said, the angels are set out to fight for you and war for you in the spirit, but everybody cannot see them. And he said, so they everywhere. So he began to allow me to see them set up in different areas, waiting on people. And so here I'm in this room again, and I see, I can see through the glass and this car pulled up and, I, and in my heart, I felt like somebody was coming to help me for once. And this, but all of a sudden, when I seen this person walk to me, I felt evil again. I felt the evil, the vibe, and I felt like that she was the enemy. And I began to back up again saying, no, not again. And I hear me saying, not again. And when this happened, she said, I got something to give you. Open your hand. She said, God sent me to bless you. And in my spirit, I shook my head and I said, no, he did not send you. And then by that time, she said, here. And then she said, you people. She said, I hate you people like that. And she said, you people. You think you know everything. And she was because you people. And by this time, she turned into Satan. And because I refused to take, and he let me know about money. He says, there's going to be some people that come to you because they know what you need. There are witches that can tap into the spirit realm, can hear things, and they know what you need. And there are going to be people coming in your life that's going to say, God sent me to you to bless you because they know ministry is in need and you build it. And he said, be careful the money that you take. Because if you would have took that money, you would have came and coveted that it was a curse. And so he taught me, he said, be careful. And you're going to need discernment because everybody thinking, oh my God, you answered my prayer. You know, we're trying to build a new facility. We, we build in a, a children ministry. We build a new lunchroom. So we praying for this, but the devil hear your prayer too. And so, some, and so he was teaching me, be careful to those that come to say, I sent them because I didn't send them. So, and I'm like, how are we going to defeat this? How are we going to know? He said, discernment. It is important in this time, discernment. You go, he said, you're going to need it. So right now, even the gift of discernment, if we don't have it, we need to seek God for it. Because the enemy going to come and he's going to sound good. And what you need, he's going to act like he got it. So uh, that was a thing that I had with that experience. By that, well, you know, that was Satan bringing a woman at like she came in the name of Jesus to bless me. And he said, if I'd have took that money, I would have came in covenant with that. Ever wanted the experience of attending a genuine royal ball? Well, here's your chance. Join Deep Believer Ministries for one of the grandest, most powerful events ever to solely honor King Jesus with a night with the King at the Broadmoor. Enjoy the magnificent grounds, accommodations, and fine dining of the five-star, five-diamond, exquisite Broadmoor Resort in Colorado Springs, Colorado. A night with the King at the Broadmoor is a very royal, very formal three days, two nights conference that will provide you with hands-on training for true Christian supernatural living by renowned teachers and evangelists. This includes training in multiple areas of healing, deliverance, spiritual warfare, 
how to walk out the abundant Christian life, as well as how to obtain success in finances God's way. Then, for the royal evening, soak in the ambiance of white tablecloth gourmet dining, live brass and stringed instruments, acclaimed Christian singers and worshipers. And what's a royal ball without ballroom dancing? Don't know how? Complimentary ballroom dance lessons are included. A night with a king at the Broadmoor will be a night of complete honor and reverence to our King Jesus and will be like nothing you've possibly ever experienced. We hope to see you there for this stately, eventful night. So why do you think the devil chose a woman to come to you? Thinking a woman, sometimes we be more sensitive or knowing what another woman need than a man. So, and he knew if a man probably came, I'd have been more fearful, you know, but a woman came, I would be more subject to her because she's a woman and she, you know, she knows your need or, and she came with compassion. She came with concern and um, wanted to bless me. And that's, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. He made you feel really comfortable to yeah. take down your mm-hmm. guard, but you know, and I just want to let everyone know watching right now. So when Anne talks about the thing, she's talking about the worldwide um, sickness that went around. So I know you mentioned, I'm going to go back a little bit. I know you mentioned that when you were in a hospital, there was death all around you. And I was going to ask you, were you able to feel the death all around you, but were you able to see it? Because you said there were death spirits yeah. walking around. Um, there was a demon. There was two demons on my left side and had no idea. God opened up one of my daughter eyes to see it. And so even when I came out the coma, I was telling her and she was shocked because she said, you're not going to believe this. And she said, I wrote it down in my journal that when you was laying in there in the coma, she said, the Lord spoke to me so clear for the first time. And she said, God said, I'm going to give you your mother eyes and you're going to see through her eyes and you're going to see what she see. And when she opened, she looked, she said, mom, I seen like in the spirit, your eyes was being transferred to mine. And I was able to see the demons around your bed. Wow. Now, were you able to see the demons to her? Mm-hmm. I was able to see the demons. Yes. And then you mentioned also that uh, the doctors had given you so much fentanyl that it could take down an elephant. I mean, they we hear it nowadays on the news that fentanyl takes down any, I'm just a little bit of fentanyl. So they were pumping you with it. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. so the fact that you survived that, I mean, yeah. shows that God's plan was bigger than whatever mm-hmm. the enemy had. He had mm-hmm. really no power uh, against your existence. Um, but that's mm-hmm. wild. I mean, like, and then you said the doctors or not the doctors, but the pharmacists were wondering if you were on drugs. Uh, the doctors was wondering because they said my body was resisting it. Matter of fact, it, it was resisting it. And, uh, and I know that it was God blocking it. And I just felt like at that time, a lot of things that they did to me, uh, what I experienced that I think a lot of it was testing and experience um, because what I had to go through, um, I have severe nerve damage, muscle damage in my legs. Um, dropped feet, my hands were pretty much, my bones was fusing. Um, I think they hid some stuff because a lot of things my family didn't know till later on. Um, things that still weren't released that we know is ours to be released to. That's ours, you know, um, because of fear and the things that happened to me. So they had a lot of things that did go wrong. I had a hole in my left knee uh, and they can't say what happened uh, in my feet top of my feet. They told my family that um, I didn't have no bed sores. I was really good and they couldn't find out. They found some pictures and it was me laying there and it took my, so because when they transferred me from one hospital to another one, you have to take pictures of that person's body, especially when you was in a coma and in the hospital. I was in the hospital seven and a half months. And so um, I had uh, bed sores all on my body, which they lied about that. So uh, they had like a cast on my leg. Matter of fact, my other daughter, she even had a dream. She said, something's wrong with my mom's leg. Something's wrong with her leg. She had no idea something was wrong with my leg. Um, That's why it's important to have a family. It's important to have someone that's going to be praying for you and believing. My whole family went on a fast. 
Uh, one of my daughters said she went in the closet and then shut up because, you know, the Bible said go in the closet. So she took it spiritually and naturally. She actually went in the closet and shut herself in the closet. Um, but so I just thank God that they prayed and they believed and they didn't take the word of man because if they would have, the, my plug would have been undone. Uh, during that time, of course, when the thing was out, you know, the ventilators was very scarcely. Uh, where I come from, where I live at, the, the hospitals had had to move on the outside. The whole parking lot in the ground was full of tents. So every the people was being admitted in the hospital outside the tent. But my kids came to the hospital. They marched around the hospital. They stood in the rain and snow and prayed at night. And when the nurses called and said, whatever y'all doing out there, keep doing it because her lumbers are changing. So the Bible said, the prayer of the righteous man availeth much. So you need prayer. You don't need to be around nobody that's negative when you're going through. Um, you don't need to be around nobody who's not speaking faith when you're going through. I believe a lot of people have their premature deaths because when the enemy came like a flood, you know, nobody was around them full of the spirit of the Lord and believing and having faith, you know, because he said faith without works is dead. And he said, those that call upon me, you got to believe I'm a water of those that seek me. You got to believe it. You got to know who you serve and know that God is able. And, you know, and God works, does his best work in the dark. God does his best work in the dark. He loved to prove the enemy wrong, that he's God. And besides him, there's no other God. Um, God brought me from death to life. Um, and when I said my spiritual things, uh, I have been to the heavens. I have experienced different things. Um, just lately, you know, even all through the time, there's more, let me th see things that come. Um, so, you know, uh, and I know that's why the enemy tried to block me because I do see things before it comes. And so um, I just, I just thank God for being alive and, and giving me another opportunity. Life is so precious and I don't take life for granted. Uh, when I came home from the hospital, I had to came home in the ambulance. Um, my doctor pointed me and said I had to take me in the ambulance because um, I couldn't set up. And my feet and my legs, if I couldn't bend my knees, they was fusing. And um, I had to have 24-hour care. Even when I came home after seven and a half months, I had 24-hour care. My mom had to move in with me. My kids, my daughters had to bathe me. I couldn't bathe myself. They had to turn me over. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I couldn't turn myself over. They had to roll me over. They had to bring the bedpan to me. So that was a whole different challenge I had to go through, humility. Um, I lay there and I weeped and I cried. And I just said, God, you know, I come home, but I believe you. I thank you for being alive. Um, um, my mom them had to feed me. Uh, they had to dress me. My daughter would come and take the water and wash my head with the rag because that's all they had nothing but to wash my scalp with the rag and telling me it's going to be okay. And sometime when I just want to let's lay there and close my eyes. And I know people want to see me and they come and see me and everything, but I had to struggle through that part of, you know, it was not, I won't say totally lonely, but it was a point of I, I shut myself off in a square box in a sense they was there, but I was in this box saying, okay, God, what's next? You know, what's gonna happen next? I, I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna believe you. Cause when I came home, I came home with oxygen machines still all around my room. Um, I had electric ones, I had the runs you pull behind the wheels and they, I came home with the pulley. That wasn't even gonna let me come home from the hospital. That was gonna put me in a nursing home. It was like the enemy was trying to block me in every area told my husband, we're not going to let your, your wife go home if you don't have a hospital bed. She's going to have to have everything before we let her go. Don't, we're going to release her to the nursing home. And my husband said, when did the people start telling you that? Where your family going to go and stay? You don't pay these bills. And my husband was getting kind of frustrated. So immediately he had to go find a CNA company that would take me. Everybody was filled up. Everybody. I had to have physical therapy. I had to have care practice. I had to have a registered nurse to come and draw blood, you know, blood thinners because my blood clogging up. I'm still on blood thinners today. And uh, so taking blood thinners and everything and coming, working with me. And every time I go to the hospital, it's a thousand dollars on the ambulance because I don't, I didn't qualify um, 
to ride on the other kind of things, the vans, because I was still on the air, the oxygen stuff. So I had to be put in the ambulance itself. And then your insurance say, well, we only cover ambulance when we get a wreck or whatever, but now this is the appointment. We ain't going to cover that. I said, that's a lot of money. So I just made it in my mind. I said, you know what, God? I said, I got a nurse come in and do my blood if something go wrong. And I'm going to trust you until I can get up off in this bed. And uh, then one day, you know, they come over and they roll me up and I, they set me up on the edge of bed. And my daughters would come and rub my feet every night and massage my body to help my feet because um, my feet was turned like this and curved under. And they told me, so I went to the doctor and they said, if you had surgery, it might make it worse. It might even hang dangling. And then I cried and asked God to forgive me because he told me it will help me now and handicap me later. I didn't know it at that time. All I knew is having drop feet with, with um, poor muscle, I mean, damaged muscle, nerve damage, loss of muscle is very painful. And uh, now all they want to give you is nerve pills. So I rejected the nerve pills. And I trusted God. I said, I'm going to trust you with this process. So now I'm no longer in the wheelchair. I'm no longer using a walker. I walk with a walking cane sometime only because why my nerves continue to heal and my bones. So that's another odd. So it's like God was just slapping the devil in the face, everything. They said I wouldn't walk. They even said I wouldn't talk. They had me set up for speech therapy because of that kind of the trait I had and I had it so long. And, um, I'm talking. No, my voice is not like it was, but I can talk. I can praise God. I can worship him and I can fellowship with my family and friends, you know. So all these little things, even my eyesight, I couldn't see good. And um, I'm like, Lord, you know, I write books and, you know, I I'm a preacher and I can't hardly see to read. Um, then one day my sight started coming back. Uh, my hands was able because I couldn't. Uh, my hands was kind of like this. Um, my shoulders was kind of almost fusing and my daughter had to come and massage my shoulders and rub me. And it was just so painful when they lift me, I had to be pulled up with a pulley to set me from the bed to a chair. So it was a lot I had to go through mentally, but I knew God was with me and I knew he was going to bring me out. Every night I went to sleep, he would give me a dream that I'm walking. And I would wake up the next day and tell my husband, guess what? And he said, what? I said, I see me walking. But then the devil tried to let me look at the pain I was in and look at your body. And you're talking about you walking. And I said, God keeps showing me that I'm walking. And I know God is the giver of dreams. I'm going to walk. He said, if you can believe what I show you, he said, you can become what you see. And so now I'm up walking, preaching again you know, doing the work of the Lord when the odds was against even that. So it is, it is just, it's a blessing. I don't take life for granted. I tell people, uh, I always love God, but it's a different intimacy. It's a different, uh, it's almost like uh, heaven. The Bible say have the mind of Christ. And it's like, if you think of something wrong, it's mentally he'll check your mind. So it's he grow calls me to grow even closer, even in the mind. It's like he get a check before you even go there. And you know, sometimes you don't even see it, but he'll give you a check that it's wrong. And so it's just a whole different walk with God. It's a whole different intimacy that I have with him. But I just advise people that, you know, no matter what your situation is, to trust God in the midst of it all. Uh, if God be for you, who can be against you? And I mean, what you just said is a lot and it's amazing. And I have a lot of questions for you, a lot of questions for you, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you mentioned something, and this is even previously uh, when we spoke earlier, you said something that really uh, gripped me, how you said when the doctors wanted to give you something, the Lord specifically said, it'll help you now if you take it but it'll handicap you later. And I feel like that's a sermon on itself. I mean, you can talk about life. Um, the devil yes. gives you bait, even like with the woman, um, mm -hmm. the woman who was actually the devil. Yeah. When they yeah. came to you, it may seem to help you then, but a handicap you later. I mean, that in itself mm -hmm. was huge. Yeah, that's what he told me. He said, it will help you now and handicap you later. Because I, I was wearing braces on my, my legs and my feet. I had to walk with braces and knee pads. And so I went to the doctor 
But after I was walking down the hall one day, I hear the Lord say, because he knew I was punted on going to the doctor. I was thinking about having surgery because I like, you know, I'm a person that wear heels and I got to get in my heels, Lord. That's what I was saying. And I literally heard him say, it's going to help you. Meaning if they did, they put a cast on me. He said, it's going to help you now. But a handicap you late, I had no idea. So when I went to the doctor anyway, after I heard the word from the Lord, I still went to the doctor. And the doctor said, it can help you now, but later on, you're going to still be in the same situation. Because we can do surgery and put a new cast, a boot on you that will fit you perfect. But you're going to have to work the rest of your life. And I broke down and started crying. And I told my husband, let's go. And I went to the car and asked God to forgive me. And But I still didn't really see the whole thing because I'm in pain. I'm still walking. Matter of fact, I'm in the wheelchair because they wheel me in the wheelchair. And during that time, and I'm like, God, you said it's going to help me now and handicap me later. That's what the man just pretty much told me. We do this surgery. You're going to still get this boot on you, but you're going to always wear it. But we just have it for you won't be in so much pain and you better walk better. I got up off the table. I sat up and I said, thank you. And it's like I wasn't meeting no compassion doctors. I said, Lord, why these people feel like that's mean? It's like they're coming after me. That's how I felt. It's like I got, you know, somebody said, we sorry. We can't help you. Now, it wasn't like that. He just turned around in the chair. We can do surgery, but it might not help you. And if it, in some people cases, your, your leg just might, your feet may dangling. And that's all he said. And we can just, I said, so what are you saying, doctor? He said, we'll just make you a new boot. One, make it personally, just for this leg here, because it's worse than the other. One. And that's how he left me. He said, but I said, so temporarily? He said, no, permanently. And I just fell back and looked at him. And I told my husband, I'm ready to go. Went to the car and he said, you okay? And I just hold my head down and tears began to run from my face. And I was like, oh my God, when is this going to stop? It's like, I got mean to me, rude doctors, no compassion. It's like when I walk into an office, it felt like I was walking into Satan camp. I can feel the darkness. I can feel the evil. I can feel almost like the door shut in my face. And I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I said, I got it. And I repented. I went home and I began and I had took my walker and I told my husband to buy me a thing, a little basket and printed my walker. And I will put my Bible in it on my phone and I will read the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Yea, though I'm walking through the valley of shadow of death. I said, Lord, I will not fear no evil for you are with me. Thou rod and thy staff, you comfort me. I said, you anointed me in the presence of my enemies. And I said, you promised me at the end. You said, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then I began to lay my hands on my legs and I began to prophesy. And I said, legs, you're going to live. And I command you to line up. In Jesus' name. And I began to speak to my nerves. I began to call. I said, nerves, I command you to be made whole. I command you in Jesus' name. I said, I take the authority and the right of the blood of Jesus Christ and the power he has visited into me. And I began to rub my legs and I prophesied my legs. And then one day, he said, come out the braces. And I started walking without the braces. And it hurt so bad. So I had acid pockets in your feet. Your feet are the only part of your body that got so many bones and nerves. There's so many nerves. You know, even nerves that go to your kidneys and everything is in your feet. That's why there's a top of your feet. If anybody know about karate, that's why they call them daily weapons. There are parts of your body that can hit and go straight to your heart and kill you. And so uh, when I'm there walking and I'm like, Lord, it hurts so bad. And I begin to hop and my daughter would come over and rub my face. She said, don't you feel them things? I said, they acid pockets. That's what my physical therapist told me. She said, it built up inside of you because of the damage. And then cause of the drop feet, I had spurs in my feet. And so that was all of that was so much painful. And, um, and I began to, I took the braces off and trusted God. Now they can't even believe that I'm not walking with braces. So I'm just waiting because my doctor told me, I want to see you walking one day. And I don't think he believed what he said, but I am going to make a trip to the hospital. I'm going to get all dangled up and I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to say, look what the Lord has done. You know, so when I'm going, I'm going with Jesus. And so. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, and I like how you prophesied and you spoke over your body and your mm-hmm. body listened to you. Uh, and I love that. I want to go back a little bit or kind of a lot. Uh, to the beginning of you being in a coma. One, when you were put into the coma, 
Did you know you were in a coma? And how was it like for you to be in a coma for almost eight months? When I was in the coma, like I said, he would open my ears so I can hear. And sometimes I felt myself fighting to come out of it. And they knew it. And see, like when I would open my eyes, I was in another world. Everything was blurry, very, very blurry. And I would go right back out. And they couldn't believe that happened. I can hear them. And next thing I know, I'm out again because I know they had to come and re push me back, you know, juice me up again. And, and I would feel myself trying to fight. I was always fighting um, to the point that I knew my spirit man was uh, awakened all the time. Um, they would be on prayer line on the uh, videos and cameras because they can talk to me through the cameras. And they put uh, healing scriptures by John Hagee, Pastor Hagee, put all his scriptures of healing in the room and they put me a thing beside my bed. And if it wasn't that taking place, it was worship music and they put the kind of music I like on. And so sometimes some nurses came in and got mad and would turn the camera off and didn't want to hear the music. And immediately, one of my kids would call back up there to the nurses, they say, look, somebody didn't cut the music off, cut it back on. And so they was well enough that they had a family that was gonna fight. So they, they began to get on a little bit more better P's and Q's. But when I was in the coma, um, I was aware of waking up before, I was aware of hearing them uh, talk with, about death over me. Some things they said, I even try to talk through my trade. Um, I don't remember that. Now, I don't remember that. Uh, they said they had over 5,000 pictures and videos. So when I look at them, I see their little faces who was on the camera that night watching me or whatever. And I could see what I'm reacting, you know. I could see me laying there, um, my heart beating. I could see my eyes had budged out my head. I got pictures that you can see my eyes actually popping in and out my head that I'm going to have frog eyes. But in the coma sense that I don't remember a whole lot, but what I went through in the coma and by me waking up a couple of times from the coma and they noticed that I was awake because I, I was all like I'm drugged up and I was talking very slurishly. I can remember that, but then I'd be back out. Matter of fact, one time I did wake up. It was raining on me. The ceiling, it was a bad storm that month, I guess. And I woke up from freezing. I was so cold. The bed was wet and water was dripping on me, but I couldn't move. My eyes opened and I would try to tell them to help me. Nobody would move me. And my family knew I was telling the truth because something happened and they had a call to the hospital. Why come I, I wasn't in that room no more? And they told them the roof have busted open and it was raining. And I think that was the month of January, a cold month. January, February was a cold month. And I was shaking because I remember saying, I'm so cold, I'm so cold and I'm wet, but I couldn't move. Uh, next thing I know again, like I'm out again, I don't remember, but I do remember that. And then when they, when I talked to my family about it later on, they knew about that because they knew I was moved and they knew the hospital ceiling was it was licking water and I told them I said I was under that water which they didn't know I was under they just knew my room was licking water and they moved me from the room and that's how they found out but they don't they didn't know during that time I was being rained on now so did you while you were in the coma did you even know that you were in a coma no mm -mm, had no idea all I know is like I said I, when he opened my ears and I know I'm fighting I knew I couldn't move I knew within me things was going on. One thing I knew, I feel, I feel like God now that it happened for me to fight because there was a time I told God I was tired. There was a time I said, Lord, I'm tired now. I said, I can't go on anymore. I told the Lord I was tired of fighting. Seemed like everywhere I go, I feel like the enemy is just an ax. I kept asking God. And this particular day, God took me in another room and a demon jumped on me and tried to bow me up. And there's scriptures, you know, you can't be bound at first. You know, the enemy come in and bound the, the strong man up. And I and he came in and he grabbed me and pinned me and was choking me and told me to die. And he said, why won't you die? And I just began to fight back and saying, no, I will not die. 
I will not die. And it seemed like this supernatural strength came over me, radiant strength of power, and they flew off of me. And the other demon came back and challenged me because that's why I was talking earlier about the ranks. This demon was a higher rank than the other demon. And this one came after me. And then they all gathered on me and tried to bound me up and pin me. And, I, and they began to curse at me. They began to say horrible words, call me out my name, um, everything. And I was still, and I said, and so one accused me of cursing him out. And I remember said, I did not curse at you. And I said, Satan, you are the, I, I said, I said, you are the brother and the father of all lies. And um, what I did say, I said, hell, get off of me. So hell, I said, hell, get off of me. And, and Satan, that when the imp said, oh, you just cursed. So Satan is accused of the brother, but I said, hell, get off of me. Because it was hell that was coming against me. And I knew it was hell. And so, and then I stood in the room and he started laughing at some of my family members. He was laughing at people I knew. And I'm in the room watching them come in and he was telling me he was going to deceive them. And I seen it and I began to fight. That's when my strength came. So I was about to give up in the vision, in the uh, coma, because I said I was tired. I said, Lord, I'm tired. I can hear me breathing. It's after you hear them seeing a movie and you hear somebody breathing real hard inside the movie. I can hear me breathing like that. I heard me breathing so hard within. And I was like, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Had no idea if somebody was looking at me. I don't know if it was my kids or one of the other apostles saying that apostle is tired. We need to pray. She's tired actuality I was tired because I fight it for all these months and I told my family I fight it day in and day out and then I felt like God had to put that in my way to give me strength because when I seen the enemy coming after my family and I seen him pointing certain ones in my family that I never told them which one it was but I seen the enemy pointing at them and I know if I didn't get to them it would be death and so I stood up and began to fight for them to live, to come against them and the enemy. So I even, God used me in the spiritual realm to fight for others to live and to see the plot that the enemy was doing for I can intervene that plot. And this is a spiritual warfare that we were talking about earlier, how yeah. while you were mm -hmm. in this coma, nobody wow. knew wow. that you were mm -hmm. in battle. You were in constant battle. And, battle. Constant, and then you actually said that demons we're digging up your foundation. You heard them say, come on, we have to dig up her foundation. Yeah. And you yeah. mentioned that you felt it. What did it Absolutely. feel like for them to dig up your foundation? God will let me feel, he will let me feel the pain from it, but he let me feel the grief. And I can hear it like it was going deep. And I can feel them when they got close to my, closer. It was like when they dug, it was like, when they was digging, I can literally describe it to you in the spirit. It was like when they started digging, it was here deep. Then it went down like a triangle and it got deeper and deeper and deeper. And I knew that was getting to this part. I can feel them. And I began to say, Lord, what are you going to do? I hear them. I hear them. And then I hear them talking and said, man, we can't get to it. He didn't say, man, he said, we cannot get to it. He said, because it's too deep. It's too deep. And God allowed me to hear that while I'm in a coma. So you have to be deep and anchored in Jesus. That's what I was about to say. I mean, your roots were deep. You were strong in the Lord. And when you said that the demons were trying to come to choke you, they said, mm -hmm. why won't you die? What yeah. went through your mm -hmm. mind? I mean, <laughs> I would have been like, that's right. I mean, so what went through your mind when you were hearing, basically they couldn't kill you? I literally screamed like so loud. I remember opening my mouth. And, and he screamed and said, I will not die. And I said, and you're going to loose me. And I've been here saying, you're going to loose me now. I will not die. I'm not going to die. You know, and they kept saying, won't you die? Why won't you die? Why won't you die? Won't you just die? And I was like, I would not die. And I kept saying, I would not die. And I just, that's why I said, I believe God had to put a situation before me for me to really fight. Because during that time when I seen the enemy coming after my family, 
this supernatural strength of love and compassion and like came over me. And I just, like I said, it was an energized strength that I can feel it beaming from in out and it was coming from me and they can feel it too because when they felt that they began to release me, slowly their hands was coming off of me. Now, and it's really good that you have a family who prays and who are also deeply rooted because they didn't stop. They kept mm-hmm. warring for you. Like you mm-hmm. said, they play the worship music. They put John yeah. Hickey's scriptures up for you. They kept speaking life into your life. Yeah. They sure did. And even when I came home, they kept on. You know, there was there. They uh, compassion, they love, they caring. There was will and nobody complained. I didn't have to worry about nothing. They was there. You know, my husband, I felt bad and I would cry because he slept in a recliner. I said, go to the other bedroom. He said, no, I'm not leaving you. And so, you know, um, because, you know, like I said, when they brought me home, they brought me home with oxygen tanks. And then one night I heard the Lord said, he said, don't get comfortable. Clear as day, three o'clock in the morning. He said, don't get comfortable. And I opened my eyes. I said, I just heard him say, don't get comfortable. And I knew it through the spirit of God. I heard him and I lay there and I'm like, do I pull it? I was going to pull it out. And I thought about it and I said, you know what? I know I heard him. I know I heard him. And I reached in my nose and pulled the tubes out at home. My husband woke up and seen it in panic. He had a fit. He ran across the room, looked at me. He said, what are you doing? Put it back in your nose. And I said, no, I know I hear God. And he looked at me. I said, you don't have to trust me. And, he, and that, so I felt so bad for him wanting to worry. So I put it back in my nose. I allowed him to put it. And he put it back. Look at the machine. Make sure it was cut back on. I lay there. And the next night come again. I woke up again about the same time. And, and it, just, it just picked on me like, pull it out. Trust me. And I pulled it out of my nose. And from that day forward, I never had it. I did not go get approved from the doctor to take it out. I said, this is it. I'm a trust God. I know I did not miss God. I have not missed him so far, and I'm not going to start now. And I said, and I had made up my mind. Now I did say this. I said, God, if I missed you, I ask you to forgive me, but I know I heard you. But if it's not you, Lord, and I die, I'm going to die in your hands. I said, because I know I heard you. And I've been breathing on my own. And about a couple, about three weeks later, I told my husband, call the people to come and get these machines out of my house, get them out of my room. I said, and get them out the following week. I said, call the people that we had to rent all this furniture from hospital furniture. I want it out of my room. I want my room back. I'm taking everything back. I'm taking my life back. I'm taking my mind back. I'm taking my home back. You know what I'm saying? So I had to take everything. The Bible says, excuse me, for the kingdom of God suffer violence and the violence take it by force. We got to speak into the mountains. We got to decree and declare and believe that God has given us power. I said, I'm taking everything back that he thought he could steal from me. And I began to say that and I was crying and he thought I was having a breakdown. He come running in the room because he hear me crying and snotting. And I said, no, I said, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to lay in this bed. I got a house to clean. Even though my mom was there, I want to cook my own food. I want to walk in my own bathroom. I don't want to come in here and see no potty. I don't want to see no nothing. I got rid of everything. And I had to put my furniture back in my room. So you were calling those things that were not as though they were, and they became Mm -hmm. that. They became that. Wow. Well, I want to go to this one thing too. This is really important. How you mentioned that, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, that witches are assigned to different places, um, places of occupation, especially hospitals. They're assigned churches, government, all this stuff, but they're assigned Mm -hmm. to hospitals. And and you know Mm -hmm. that all too well. What would you say to those who have to go to the hospital? Um, you know, for certain things, uh, what would you say to those to prepare themselves for that type of environment? Because a lot of times we don't know until we get there or some people don't even know. Mm -hmm. They don't know. I mean, they can disguise themselves good. Um, I had a a situation not related with this, but a woman, I knew she was kind of I would say, little, you know, prejudice. Some people are prejudiced, you know, and all, all races is prejudiced some type of way. Some people, so 
Uh, and she had made a statement one day. She said, you don't want to mess with me because I worked at the hospital. She literally threatened me that she works at the hospital. She said, remember that. You might have to come through me one day. And I didn't, I'm like, so yes, there are people out there. You have to be careful. And that's why the Bible says, show yourself to be friendly because you don't know who you're dealing with. You don't know who you dealing with unless, and you need to be prayed up when you go in there, you need to pray over yourself. When I go to the hospital doctor office now, this learned me so much. I pray before I go, when I'm in the office, I go, I be saying, I plead the blood of Jesus over this office. You know, all doctors don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in the Lord thy God. They got their own religion. And so number one, when they come in you, in the room, even though you don't talk your religion with them and they don't talk theirs with you, you should ask God to give you discernment. And you should be able to know these things for you and know how to pray over yourself and cover yourself because see you in there, your fleshly part might not know, but your spirit man knows what they got inside of them. And you just ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you and teach you, reveal these things to you. And sometimes you got to just learn how to be humble. You know, the Bible said, when the man ways please the Lord, he'll make his enemy be at peace. So when your ways please the Lord, even you in the midst of your enemy, he said, I make them be at peace with you. So we have to stay humble, you know, be watchful and have our ears open, you know, be listening, watch and never take any answer and take it. You know, I had rejected medicine. I had no idea that they were going to put it in the system, that I rejected the medicine. And I'm like, oh, wow. He, I, he said, why are you not going to take this medicine? Because when I was in the hospital, I had a feeding tube. And because of that, I couldn't, I was, I lived off in, um, protein and vitamins. That's all they gave me through my tube, protein and vitamins. So therefore, they had to give me insulin shots because I didn't have enough, whatever they call it, to, my insulin, I had to keep my insulin up. So that will cause you to be a diabetic. So they kept that in my record. And they kept trying to give me this medicine for diabetic. I said, sir, I've never been a diabetic. I'm only a came a diabetic because of the, the uh, feeding tube. I said, but I'm not on the feeding tube anymore. He said, well, your lumbers are this. So we're going to give you this medicine. So I said, well, I'd rather not take it. And he said, do you understand diabetes is a solid killer? And it can do this. I said, yes, but I was never a diabetic before. And he said, well, because of this, it will cause you to become a diabetic. So I did not take the medicine. I trust God. And I said, I tell you what. So I kind of made a deal with him. I said, my next appointment, if my lumbers are still high, I take the medicine. I came back my next appointment, my lumbers was down. He said, you're not even borderline diabetic. So you cannot accept everything man give you. You got to trust God. He knows your body. And so, but if I would have took that medicine, they said that pretty much ought to have been on it permanently because this, if you take this medicine, it will cause you to become a diabetic. And so, yes, I learned all of that through this and I rejected it. So when I went to the doctor, he turned around, he said, I see you rejected this and this. And I said, I rejected a cholesterol. I went back about two months ago, heart failure, no longer have me down for heart failure. He said, we don't know what's going on with you. He said, Miss Herb, you're not even, he said, we're going to take you off the list of heart failure. I had congestion, heart failure. So you, God is healing me with his process. As I trust him, he's building up my faith to, to different areas. I don't have no kidney failure. They thought my kidneys were going to fail, be on dialysis. Um, going back, you know, just everything he's just turning everything around N no nothing you know my mind is working I can talk I can see I can walk and uh, one doctor made a comment to me he said Miss Harris I'm going to give you some advice and I said what's that he said your story going to be real I never thought about it I have never thought about coming on Zoom Facebook Twitter nothing but he said that and I'm like why would he say that and he said, because there are some people, he made it, he said, your story, he said, you gonna have, you got yours in paper. And, um, and, and he said, so when I go to the doctor at times, people come in my, in the office, scared me and my husband. I thought we had bad news. And everybody, my husband said, is everything okay? And they said, there's no reason. We had to come in here and see. And the head doctor of the whole clinic came in and said, there's no medical reason you are, should be alive. We can't prove and have no facts. Why are you here today? You should not be in this office. 
That was the words of the doctor. And even now, when I go to different appointments, my records will come in the system of appointments and they'll come in here and say, I heard about you even up to today. Wow. And that is all good news. And speaking of all good news, well, that's good news, right? But speaking <laughs> of good news, when you were in a coma, it wasn't all bad because you were actually taken to, you had a vision mm -hmm. of the rapture. Yeah. Wow. So tell us what you saw. Um, the rapture. I was laying there. He took me up in the spirit and I knew it. I was in the rapture. I knew it through the spirit of God because in my spirit, I was talking to God and telling God, this is the rapture. And I knew it. And through the spirit, he verified it was the rapture. And then as I began to send up, I can feel the wind. I can feel the breeze against me. And I, the clouds begin to gather around me. And then when I looked up, there were so many clouds. The clouds were so beautiful, like pillows, like fluffy clouds. And then I looked up to my left and right. There were so many people. You couldn't count the people. And as I entered in, the clouds separated. And the clouds pulled back like a curtain. And the people began to come from behind the clouds to meet the pe other people that was being caught up. So it was like, these are the people that was already there. These are the new people that's been caught up to the rapture, but they came out to meet them and to greet them. And, and but when they did it, I said, God, I said, Lord, I said, they know them. They are greeting them. And then I picked up in the spirit, some was family members and some was not, but, but there are family because by the spirit, they are family and they knew them and they were celebrating them. And then the clouds hid them. Well, okay. So are you saying that those who went before us, who went to heaven, they met us in the sky. Uh -huh. So they were that there. Was the yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they came down from heaven to meet us as we went up. So how did it start? How did, how did this vision he just, start off? When I have visions, they just come. And sometimes he slowly bring them. Sometime uh, I know I can see them coming. And as I continue to keep my mind focused on God and be worship or praying, they become more visible like a TV screen. This is clear as you can see me, I can see. And like I said, that I knew them. I didn't know them per se, but he was get, let, get, letting me see that they knew one another and there were so many people and they was already there and the other ones was reaching out. And it's like when they stepped, when it, when the rapture came and the, the Bible said he would meet them in the, they would meet them in the mid air. That's what was taking place. That was in the mid air. And then when they got where the clouds was, the clouds and the, cl the clouds even had like a floor part and they stepped from up to the clouds and walked up to meet them and they greeted them and then they began to go behind the clouds and the clouds cover them but the people on earth couldn't see this wow wow and then speaking of that on top of that the lord actually took you to heaven as well mm -hmm. what happened there when heaven you know, everybody said that, you know, the Bible talks about he gave you a mansion in Matthew, you know, that if it was not so, he would not have told you he's going to prepare a place. And I hear some people tell their testimonies about heaven and stuff, and they didn't see mansions. I said, well, God only showed me what's in the word. And so if I don't see it in the word, it's, I don't really eat it or accept it because he, he, the word is who he is. And it doesn't change with revelation or whatever it is, it is what it is. So when he lifted me to heaven, he showed me mansions and the mansions was kind of set like in mountains, like in hills, but there was so many and there was beautiful. There was lovely mansions and he showed me the streets and the streets was so gold. You can see through them like glass. They were shine and the river of water looked like it had diamonds so bright that the water was shine like it was purified. The, the, um, the sparkles and the brightness came from the cleansness. And in the middle of the town, the middle of the city was a mountain and the mountain had smoke and the mountain is where the father rise, but we couldn't go there, but it gave light into the city. And so these are the things that I see. And then, you know, before, you know, I tell people, that's why I tell people they're different levels and, um, he will let me know that there, that he does have a mansion for us and, and he's promised and it ain't no, it ain't no old rundown place. It's, 
it's beautiful. And, and it, everything was like um, the air. Imagine if you ever seen something, you seen people drop uh, like a little crystal and it just light up the sky and you seen little sparkles what man try to make. You can't even compare that. Even the air that you breathe there is so clean and so pure that it, it, it's, a, it's just fresh. It's a freshness. And so, and that's what I was seeing. So, you know, like heaven. So when people say, well, they seen little houses there and little ranches, I said, well, I, I seen what the Bible say. You know, I see what... <laughs> Cause I feel like why he gonna put me on a ranch? Yeah, I don't. Want, I be, I lived on a ranch. I lived in the country. <laughs> but he said he said you will have a mansion, and that's what he showed me a mansion. Wow. Okay. And then so how did you even get to get to heaven? I mean, was this why you were in a coma? Or was this after? This was after the coma, and so like right after, like see when I was at home, I was still in and out. It was like half of the time I was in and out. And every time I remember they come in there and they will wake me, they said, she's out again. It's like I had no control of being awake. I would, he would just take me right back out. And I was just sleeping. My, you know, they would touch me. My body would be on fire. My mom said, why are you so hot? I said, I don't know. I can feel the heat coming from my body. It's like I was letting out steam. And I knew that was his presence. I mean, I would just be burning up and I can feel it. And I have to say, take the cover off of me. And my mama said, why are you so hot? Why are you burning up? I mean, even my touch, my body, I will be burning. And Ansel, so, and you wrote a book about this. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us a little bit about, I know you're, that's your testimony, but could you tell us a little summary about the book, what people will read when they read it and where they can find it? Uh, it's, uh, you can find it at Amazon. You can find it at Walmart, Books a Million. Um, you can find it on apostleandministry.com, apostleandministry.com. You can find all my books there. I have several books, so you can find my books there. But trust in God in the midst of it all came about is uh, he put in my spirit that I was going to write a book about trusting. And I started writing it, and I finished it. And I put it on Facebook. I put it out there, said, coming soon. Uh, five months passed by, coming soon, you know, and I'm like, Lord, wait a minute. I've, I've finished the book and they waiting on it. I mean, I've totally finished it and, and I already put the page out there and seen the cover of the book and had no idea it was going, I couldn't finish it till after I went through my test and my journey to talk about trusting God in the midst of it all. Then I understood trusting God in the midst of it all, even when it looks like odds is against you, trust God. When it looks like there's no more hope, trust God. When every door has been shut, you know, everywhere you turn, trust God. Because in the midst of it all, because he's in everything. God is in every situation. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too little. There's, you know, his arms are not short, you know, concerning us. You know, I tell people there's no hole too deep. There's no mountain too high that God can't reach or he can't reach down. So trusting God in the midst of, of it all was finished being birthed after I came out from my journey, from, you know, going through what I had to go through uh, for that, this long period of time. And um, at that time, when I first got home, I couldn't write it, finish it, because I couldn't write, hold the pen good. And then when I was able to put a pen in me, I laid in my bed and finished it. Uh, they bought me like a hospital table. They were pulled to my bed and I, they would mash the button set up and I would write from my bed. On top of that, you pastor a church with your husband in Fayetteville, mm -hmm. North Carolina. So yes. if anyone wants to visit you, uh, attend your services, meet you, um, and even just to hear a word from the Lord, mm -hmm. where can they find you? Uh, we're in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We at 20, uh, I think it's, yeah, 2013 Ramsey Street, Fayetteville, 2013 Ramsey, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Uh, me and my husband, we oversee several churches. Uh, we have two churches in Africa as well, you know, uh, and the school in Africa of children. Um, that, but that's where we can be found at. We pastor the one on Ramsey Street, 2013 Ramsey Street. And the one on Ramsey Street, what's, what's the name of that church? Daily Walk Ministry. Daily walk, and we'll have all that at the bottom if that's what you would like. Okay. Um, 
And then also, could you do us a favor? Could mm-hmm. you end us out in prayer? I mean, what you just described was not only powerful, but it's real. And mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if someone else uh, was in a coma like you or any, it's just the fact that you and your family are a testimony that you stood on the word of God and the Lord came through for you. You trusted the Lord right. and he provided for you. Now there's people who are going through things right now who they're losing hope and they don't see a way out. They may feel like God's maybe ignoring me or maybe God's saying, no, I'm supposed to be this way or my situation is supposed to fail. Could you pray for those who are losing hope right now yeah. that they'll get that hope? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, oh most wise and precious God, Father, we just want to say we thank you for life, health, and strength, God. God, we just want to thank you for who you are, God. God, we thank you for being the author and the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end. God, we know there's nothing too hard for you, oh God. And God, those that are watching right now, Father God, that's going through a storm, Father God. Oh God, is facing many different tests and trials, oh God. You said you will not put no more on than they can bear, oh God. Father God, just pray, oh God, that you just send forth your Holy Spirit, God. God, move in every area, God. Restore their minds and their heart, God. God, empower them through the Holy Spirit, knowing, oh God, that they are conquerors, oh God, that they are survivors, oh God, that no weapon that is formed against them shall not prosper, oh God, that they shall live and not die and declare the work of the Lord, God. God, no matter what doctor report, oh Father God, marriage, God, with children, oh Father God, oh God, with finances, oh God, Lord, you said cast our cares upon you for you care for us, oh God, you the same God yesterday and today and forever. You have not lost your power, oh Father God, the blood still works. And Father God, I rebuke and bind the hands of the enemy right now, God. God, God, we come against the spirit of torment, oh God. Some people right now, oh God, is being tormented even in their dreams, oh Father God. Being tormented, oh Father God. Oh Lord God, we cast the strong man down right now that they have the mind of Christ, oh Father God. That you restore them in their bodies, oh God. Those that have been sick, oh God, with the affliction, oh God. God, you promise us through your word, oh Father God. Your word will not come back and void us. You accomplish what it's sent out to do. Father, we stand on your word, Isaiah 53, verse 5, that you was wounded for our transgression. You were bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace is upon you and with your stripes that we are healed. God, we decree and declare victory right now in every area, oh God. Oh God, give them the strength to hold on, God. God, give them strength, oh God, God, in the name of Jesus, oh God. We thank you right now, God, for the peace of God. Lord God, they need peace today, God. They need strength, oh God. They need guidance, oh Father God. Oh Lord God, give them that, oh God. Oh God, we thank you right now for what you're doing, God, and we believe in you right now, God. I thank you for your anointing right now, God, that every here, God, that's listening right now, God, oh God, that everyone that's listening, oh God, I pray, oh God, that this word, oh Father, this prayer, Father, fall on good ground, oh God, God, heal them in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, and amen, <laughs> and Harris, you pray like my mother, thank you, it is powerful, <laughs> I love it, um, I want to thank you so much uh, for sharing your testimony, for that strong prayer, Um, and again, I'm going to have everything in the description for whoever wants to reach out to you, who would like to buy your books, everything is going to be in the description below. And I want to thank you again for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If you'd like to be born again and give your life to Jesus Christ today, pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and am lost without you. I'm convinced that you're my only saving grace and my only hope. No longer do I want to do life without you. I believe that you came to earth to die on the cross for my sins, rose from the dead three days later, and are coming back for me one day soon. Please come into my heart and be my Lord, Savior, and friend. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, get yourself a Bible and read it daily and ask God to interpret every word for you. Then surround yourself with like-minded believers in Jesus Christ. Congratulations and welcome to the family.